what the Congressional Free Thought Caucus allows us to do is it gives us a clear place to go on the Hill for a lot of church state work. So all the bills we talked about, we know who to go to. If something is coming up in committee that we need a certain perspective on, we know who to go to. We have expertise. Right now, I think the Congressional Free Thought Caucus has started at 10, and now it's at 15. So we're continuing to build momentum, um, and it's a lot of people who are in senior positions in the House. Hopefully, we'll be able to expand to the Senate soon. So right now, you'll hear from the co-chair uh, and one of the founders of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, Representative Jared Huffman from California. Hi, everyone. I'm Congressman Jared Huffman. I have the honor of representing California's beautiful North Coast. But beyond representing this spectacular district, I feel like I've sort of become the surrogate representative for countless folks across the United States that identify as non-religious. As many of you know, I'm the token humanist in Congress. A few others are coy about how they describe their religious views, but I've come right out and said it. I'm a humanist, which means I don't believe in God. I first dropped this bombshell in 2017 because, frankly, I was tired of dodging the question. I felt that my constituents deserve to know where I stand, not just on things like separation of church and state as issues, but on what makes me tick, including the moral framework by which I try to live my life and which informs the work I do in Congress. Now, at the time, it was pretty novel, to say the least, that a member of Congress would publicly acknowledge they don't believe in God. And unfortunately, it is still extremely rare, as in, it's just me so far. <laughs> but I'm hardly alone. Many of my friends in Congress share my views. A large swath of my constituents have similar views. And as you know, the nuns are the fastest growing religious demographic in America. My constituents keep reelecting me, which suggests that they're comfortable with my humanist values, and they appreciate the hard work I do for the district, which is way more important than religious labels anyway. So for me, being a human, humanist is uh, not a political liability. It's actually somewhere between irrelevant and actually positive. Now, I'm doing my part to bring Congress closer to the secular institution that founders like Payne, Jefferson, and Madison envisioned and which the Constitution is supposed to require. Along with my friends Jamie Raskin and Jerry McNerney, I founded the Congressional Free Thought Caucus in 2018. And we are an ever-growing group. We're now up to 17 members. Our work is driven by a few key pillars. First, promoting public policy based on reason and science. Protecting the secular nature of our federal government. Opposing discrimination against individuals for their faith or lack of faith and providing a forum for members of Congress to discuss their moral frameworks, ethical values, and personal religious journeys. Now, the work of our caucus is more important and relevant than ever, as our radical Supreme Court and an emboldened MAGA Republican base uh, keeps dragging us closer to their vision of a dystopic theocracy. We face an onslaught of violations of the Establishment Clause, and white Christian nationalism is clearly on the rise. We don't need to look far for proof of their intent. The January 6th attack on the Capitol made it abundantly clear that this violent ideology poses a serious threat to our security and our democracy. I'm thankful for the report co-authored by the Freedom From Religion Foundation and Baptist Joint Committee that exhaustively illustrates the role white Christian nationalism played, not only during the January 6th insurrection, but in the months leading up to it. This was the connective tissue that tied disparate groups together and propelled them into action. I urged the undertaking of this report, and after it was released, the Free Thought Caucus held a briefing on its findings. I can confidently say that it has informed my fellow caucus members and my own views on that dark day and on the work that we must do in response. I continue to encourage all my colleagues in Congress to not only familiarize themselves with the insidious ideology of white Christian nationalism, but also to stand up to it. There's no doubt that for many, religion plays a vital role in their daily lives. But subjecting others to one religion using federal and state government resources, this is entirely unacceptable and illegal. And it's time for us all to wake up to this danger. I'm proud to share with you that I have undertaken two other recent actions against the incursion of religion into the public sphere. First, I introduced the Health Share Transparency Act to limit the ability of so-called Christian health shares to market themselves to consumers. 
Now, these health care sharing ministries peddle fraudulent, unregulated health coverage products under the guise of religion. But with my bill in place, we can protect consumers from these predatory practices, and we can make sure that they have the information they need to make better health care decisions for themselves and their loved ones. Health shares will also be forced to disclose a range of information to inform future regulation, and they will be fined if they don't comply. It's a really good bill. I also recently wrote a letter to the IRS requesting that they review the tax status of the Family Research Council and examine whether existing guidance is enough to prevent groups like this from abusing IRS church status. Family Research Council claims that it is an association of churches, despite not having worship services or other characteristics that the IRS requires to qualify an entity as a church. They also engage explicitly in political activity. The FRC filed amicus briefs supporting the overturning of Roe versus Wade. They advocate for legislation that would ban gender-affirming surgery. They've sought religious exemptions to civil rights laws and on and on. Churches, by law, must not engage in politics. It is really clear that the IRS needs to do a lot more oversight and diligence uh, to make sure political advocacy groups are not falsely qualifying as churches. So these are just a few of the things that we're working on in Congress. There's a lot more ahead of us. And I am so thankful to all of you for your partnership. Your voices are critical in this fight for, as President Biden puts it, the soul of our nation. Please continue to make your voices heard with your members of Congress. I think together we can protect our secular democracy, and I look forward to continuing this important work with you. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Huffman. And now our next speaker um, is Rep uh, Representative Jamie Raskin from Maryland. And uh, what committee is he on? January 6th. What else did he do? Impeachment. What else? There's one more. OK, yes, um, which is really good. Uh, that's, and you'll hear more about that. And also key member of uh, Judiciary Committee and also House Oversight. This is a good guy to have on our team. And we're really honored to have him. So Representative Jamie Raskin from Maryland. Hey, everybody. It's Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland's beautiful 8th Congressional District. I'm sending my greetings to all my friends down there in San Antonio at the FFRF convention. Um, I'm thrilled that you guys are there and that you are fighting for freedom and democracy and progress uh, in Texas and supporting all of our friends there um, who are in some tough fights. Um, I'm a founding member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which promotes public policy on the basis of reason, science, and moral values and protects the secular character of our government and the rights of religious free exercise for everyone. Um, and I should uh, start out by saying that uh, there's no freedom uh, for religion or freedom of religion unless there's freedom from religion, because what happens in a theocratic state is one religion captures political power in the state, and then they use that power to uh, intimidate and chill the free exercise of everybody else. And that's been the history. Whenever we allow one church to capture state power, um, then it oppresses and marginalizes and extinguishes the other religious sects as well as the rights of free thinkers in the society. So um, we're not going to have freedom of religion and we're not gonna have freedom for religion unless we have freedom from religion. That's why I'm delighted to speak to you guys today. Um, the uh, cause that you have assembled for is of um, essential importance to American constitutional democracy. Our framers were enlightenment liberals who rebelled against thousands of years of uh, theocracy and religious domination of government and inquisition and crusades and witchcraft trials um, and all of the various maladies that come from allowing particular religious sects or cults to take over um, state power. So America is the country that was 
first founded on the principle of separation of church and state. That was the great breakthrough and epiphany and um, idea of James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin and Tom Paine and those framers who thought who fought for uh, an Enlightenment Constitution. So we're still in the struggle for that today. Seems like uh, a week doesn't go by when one of my colleagues gets up on the floor of the House and starts uh, denouncing um, the Supreme Court's decision in Engel versus Vitale and saying that um, that was the moral downfall of America when the Supreme Court banned prayer in the public schools. Um, I always need to point out at that moment that uh, the Supreme Court never banned prayer in the public schools. As long as there are pop math quizzes, there will be prayer in the public schools. Um, and Engel versus Vitale was actually the beginning of muscular enforcement of what Jefferson called in his famous letter to the Danbury Baptists, the wall of separation between church and state. So we're still fighting for that. Uh, every day we are fighting against the theocrats and the autocrats and the kleptocrats and all of the enemies of democracy have found each other from uh, Moscow to Mar-a-Lago, all of them uh, in league with uh, the religious cultists and the would-be dictators and tyrants, all of them trying to overthrow American democracy. So we've got to hang tough against the forces of white Christian nationalism that arrayed against us on January 6th, right alongside the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and the Aryan Nations and the militia groups and the QAnon networks. We've got to stand strong for reason. We've got to stand strong for science. We've got to stand strong for a constitutional democracy. And we've got to stand strong for progress, empirical progress for everybody in the country. And I want to thank you guys for hanging tough for those basic organizing principles um, of democracy and civilization. Overhanging everything is the threat of climate change. We have no hope of uh, turning things around on climate change and saving our species if we can't operate based on science and reason. And we're not gonna be able to do that until we rescue our democracy from the clutches of those who would try to devour it and that means the autocrats and the kleptocrats and the theocrats who are all in league against democracy and freedom in America. So hang tough, everybody. Thank you for the fight. And uh, I look forward to hearing about um, all of the events that have taken place at your conference.